welcome to SANS webcast, Wrecked Casino, Lessons Learned, part four of four. Uh, this is the fourth part of our Wrecked Casino series and recordings of the previous three parts can be viewed at sans.org slash webcast uh, in case you're interested or uh, directly at a link here that I will just drop in our chat. As soon as I find our chat. Okay, and uh, this is also the second webcast uh, in our series on uh, cybersecurity leadership triads. This triad is covering vulnerabilities, controls, and security operations. Uh, more information on the triads can be found at sans.org slash cybersecurity leadership. And uh, I'll also drop an article in the chat as soon as we get going for reference so that you can uh, look into those if you're interested further. Uh, and our speakers for today are SANS instructor and co-author of Management 516, David Hazar, uh, senior instructor and author of Security 566, James Tarla, and uh, instructor and co-author of the new Management 551, Mark Orlando. Uh, oops, excuse me. And uh, if during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, uh, please go ahead and enter them in the questions window at any time. We will be handling questions at the end. Um, unless we take a couple as we're going. Uh, this webcast is also being recorded and will be made available uh, on that link that you'll find in chat as well as on the registration page for this webcast. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to James. Great, thanks Randall, I appreciate that. So my name is James Trolley, and I'm gonna just reintroduce myself real quick here. Um, I'm hoping that everyone had the opportunity to listen to a number of the other webcasts in this series, in fact, uh, I would I'd say right away, if you haven't had a chance to see parts one through three, I would definitely take the time to go back and listen to those as you're, you're thinking about listening to these series. Um, what you'll find is that we provide a lot of background information, uh, a lot of information about the specific topics um, that are sort of unique to each of the speakers on the panel today. And it'll probably provide you more context. Now, we're actually not gonna recover a lot of that information today. So if you do have questions or maybe something we're saying doesn't exactly make sense, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to those uh, to make sure you get the full context. Like I said, if you haven't heard those already. So like I said, uh, there are uh, parts one through three there. Uh, if you haven't seen those, uh, I would definitely go back and check those out if you can. All right, now that being said, what we're gonna do is let me just give you a little bit of background though, for those of you that may not have seen uh, some of this um, earlier uh, in the presentation, uh, in some of the previous webcasts. Uh, the, the idea that we've been doing with this triad, as well as with a few of the others, is that we're giving you some background around a fictitious company uh, and some of the operational challenges uh, that you'd find in a situation like this. Now, remember, this is a fictitious company, but I think a lot of you will probably recognize very quickly that the information that we're presenting here, although fictitious, you're going to see this very much mimics some of the things you've probably experienced or things you've read about in the news or things that you're seeing uh, about uh, other events or similar situations that have taken place for other organizations. And so what we're gonna do here is hopefully take a look um, a little bit at RECT. Actually, if we can go back to the previous slide, just one second there, and hopefully some people can hear me a little bit better. I'm gonna make, make some mic adjustments so um, people can maybe hear me a little bit better. So just let us know um, if we're having any issues there and maybe we can get that adjusted. Thank you, James, uh, that's a bit better. Is that better? Okay, great, I hope so. All right, so with RECT though, what you'll see is, you know, this is again a 20 year old company um, that fell victim to a ransomware attack. And the idea, of course, is as many of you have been watching these cases in the news, or maybe you participated in some of these cases, and hopefully you haven't had to go through that. Um, but if you've had one of those situations go on, what you're going to find is that most of these are, are really now more and more targeted attacks. If we were to go back maybe five years, you're going to see that these attacks really were um, sort of run in the mill, sort of drive-by malware, uh, really more of, an, more of an annoyance than anything else. And sort of this, this massive volume-based play to try to see if they could get as much um, cryptocurrency or you know, payments and ransom as they possibly could to get files back. But what we're finding now is that these have become much more targeted efforts. 
So yes, Rect had this ransomware event, but if we're looking at this in 2021, we're expecting that this probably isn't just a random occurrence. Could they have possibly just fallen for a link? Sure, right? Could they have fallen for a fish? Sure. And that was probably part of the equation. But the reality is, is that more and more what we're finding is cybercrime groups are using this as ways to get cash. And so what that means is they're going to be going after particular targets of interest that they think have the most likely payout. And what we're finding is even in the last couple of years is that not only are they doing ransomware, but now as part of their effort, what more and more the cybercrime groups are doing is they're pairing the ransomware with data theft as well, which it turns out is what's happened in this situation too. And what they're doing is they're saying, listen, uh, you can pay us to get your data back and we'll give you the crypto keys. So you can go ahead and decrypt the information that's there. But the other side of this then is if you don't pay us, then we're gonna release this information out in the world. And you've probably heard statements from the FBI and other law enforcement groups basically saying, listen, don't pay these groups, right? It encourages bad behavior. But the reality is, is these actors are taking more and more steps to ensure that they're actually paid. Again, this is just a money-making opportunity. And what you're going to find is they're not trying to cause companies harm. They just want to get paid. And so at the end of these incidents, what you're finding is they want you to be able to recover because if you don't and word gets out that after the crypto event takes place or ransomware takes place, that you're not able to recover, then those crime families basically get a bad name. And the result of that then is future people don't pay. The whole point is how do we get people to pay? This is a money making exercise. All right, and that's what we see happen here um, to Rect. So there's a lot of things we're seeing here, right? No security program. Um, we're seeing that there's some governance issues in place, um, improper technical controls, administrative controls in place. And it, and it reminds me a lot of many of the clients that I've worked with where organizations have simply done their best or sort of done a little bit of security as they had free time, but it never really was a concerted effort. And that's what we're seeing here with Rect. It's not a priority. It's not, a, not an event, not a program that management has really taken uh, seriously there. So if you look at the next page, uh, next slide, uh, you can see a little bit there more, again, just some information about, um, again, going on and of course some, some fun graphics and all that. And, and the hope of all this at the end of the day is that if you find yourself in these scenarios, or if you find that, again, you've taken security somewhat seriously, but you've not maybe prioritized or not put the resources into it um, that are necessary, unfortunately, we're finding there are consequences. And, and ransomware tends to be the one that's getting a lot of attention, just again, like I said earlier, because of the pure volume play uh, that we're seeing with these kinds of breaches. So let's go on to the next slide. And what I want to start with today, and we'll go over to the rest of the panel members here this morning, is I'm going to take this from the perspective of the Center for Internet Security's uh, CIS controls, uh, also known as the Critical Security Controls. Uh, this is a document that we published, as many of you know, back in 2008. Uh, and we've been releasing new versions every one to two years. Uh, in fact, for those of you who've been paying attention or maybe listen to some of the webcasts, uh, a lot of you know that we have a new version of this that's actually coming out in May. Uh, so version eight will be released right around the RSA timeframe, which is generally when we release the new versions. Uh, so you're gonna see even some new updates for that taking place here very soon. So in the previous webcast, I had an opportunity to talk a little bit how these controls overlaid these kinds of incidents. So you could try to understand how the threats from some of these attacks, like we're seeing with uh, this ransomware incident, how that overlaps with the controls that are here to possibly stop that. And you have to remember that the whole point that we had, we started those CIS controls. The point of that project was to be able to say, we want the offense to inform the defense. In other words, the people that are doing these offensive activities, we want them to tell the defenders what they need to do to stop it. So if it's red teams, if it's people doing penetration testing, incident handlers looking at attacker activities, that's the way that we want to decide how to prioritize, at least part of the way we decide how to prioritize some of these attacks. Now, if you look at the next slide, one of the things I didn't put into context in my last presentation that I want to sort of just give everyone sort of a high level view of is the overall risk management context as it relates to these controls. Now, in the last, con uh, the last, um, the last webcast, I went into a little bit more detail on this, but I want to take sort of a 50,000 foot view this time um, to talk about where this sort of fits into the big equation. And what you'll see is if we put this in the context of risk management, uh, these are sort of the uh, 10 steps of risk management uh, that we have as part of what's called uh, the collective risk model, uh, which is also being uh, updated and released here in May. Um, you basically see the steps of risk management and you see risk management basically broken into two phases. 
Uh, the top line, which is a green line, uh, has to do with risk management for the purpose of control selection. And then once we know what good looks like, the second list, the blue circles you see, is now risk management for the purpose of gap analysis. In other words, to figure out, are we doing the good things that we should be doing in order to defend ourselves? So when we're looking at a situation like RECT and we're saying to ourselves, okay, what are the good things that a company like RECT or any of you listening on the webcast should be doing? Now, how do we decide what good looks like? Now, the reality is, is most of us don't have the time to do the green circles. You know, as much as we'd love to, as much as we'd like to take the time to be able to do that, the reality is, is most of us just don't have the time to do detailed threat inventories and threat modeling and things. As cool as it sounds, it's also very time consuming. Well, in the context of those green circles and deciding what good looks like, we basically see that there are two types of, of events or controls that come out of this sort of leading us how we can measure risk in an organization. And what I'll do when I sort of when I refer to that is I always refer to this as either control oriented risk assessment or more event oriented risk assessment. Now, when you look at the overall maturity of an organization, what you're going to find is most every organization early in their journey is going to start this process to try to avoid the wrecked scenario by doing control oriented activities. In other words, we're going to patch systems, we're going to do an inventory, we're going to put in application control, endpoint protection, whatever it might be, right? And so there are certain control oriented activities we'll do. And then as we get more mature in this process, what we find we start to do is start to do more event-oriented activities. We start being aware of what's happening, not just what are the good things we're doing. So if you look at the next slide, this sort of will transition to, um, to Mark and David um, in the next section as well, is that the CIS controls we talked about already do provide that library of prioritized defenses that you can use to architect your security. That's the whole point of this. We wanna be specific with you and say, if you do these things, you have a better chance of stopping these attacks from taking place. That's the whole point of this project, and it's what we've been doing for almost 13 years now. And we look at the two areas we're going to talk about. I understand that there's other CIS controls other than the two that I've mentioned here that are going to be referenced, but at a sort of the priority level, in, uh, CIS control number three, the big focus of that is vulnerability management. And if organizations come to me and say, okay, James, really, we just need to pick one control oriented approach to defending our organization. What I'm gonna tell them is look at vulnerability management and it's covered with CSC number three. Um, it's sort of a control oriented quick win. Um, and there's lots of good tools out there to sort of help facilitate that process. But as we get into a longer term approach on this, as we start to look at a more event oriented, a more operational win that we're looking for, as we get more maturity, as we have more of these controls in place, that's where we're gonna be looking at security operations. And yes, um, CIS control number six is a big part of that. Um, there are definitely others though. Um, three could be included, 12 could be included. There's a number of others that are sort of uh, would fit into that list. But the point being is that these are subsets of that prioritized list um, that we've sort of looked at for big picture wise within the CIS controls themselves. Now, that being said is let me transition this over to Mark and David so that they can sort of pick up that conversation and sort of show how these, these fit into that big picture. All right, uh, let's go to the next slide here. Can you all hear me okay? I just wanna make sure we cover that before we, before we move on. Yep, loud and clear, doing well, thank you. All right, great, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm looking at this from a vulnerability management perspective and, and you know, in my mind, and, and I am admittedly a bit biased because I've been involved in vulnerability management for over a decade now, uh, longer if you include my time in, in IT, uh, and actually on the, the remediation or treatment side of vulnerability management. But it seems like to me that everything that we do, not everything, I guess, because that's unfair, but most if not many, if not most of the things that we do in security are to help us do vulnerability management better or to compensate for the fact that we aren't doing vulnerability management that well. So think about that as we go through. I'm gonna talk about the relationship between my class on vulnerability management or the, 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 the M MGT 516 triad versus or in relation to um, James's course on the critical security controls and Mark's course on the uh, on security operations. And so, if we move to the next slide, 
what I want to talk about here is if you look at the critical security controls and how many of them are related to vulnerability management, there's four within the top six, right? The first couple are on asset management, which is really foundational to a lot of security capabilities, but in particular vulnerability management. Then we have an actual number three that, that, that James mentioned that is directly related to vulnerability management. Then we have patch management, configuration management, application security, and, and pen testing, right? So those are the critical security controls, four of the basic, four out of six of the basic, seven out of 20 of the total controls are directly related to what we're talking about right now. Um, if we dig into this a little bit, asset management, those are controls number one and two. Gartner is thinking that by 2022, this came out a couple of years ago, but they said by 2022, 50% of IT asset management initiatives will be primarily driven by information security. And, you know, that's not hard to, to fathom right now with all of the different reasons why asset management helps us do security better. Um, and, you know, the fact that we, have in a lot of areas, right, even in vulnerability management, we continue to struggle, continue to fail. It's not like these are new capabilities within organizations. We've been doing asset management for a long time. We've been doing vulnerability management for over 20 years, but a lot of organizations continue to struggle. Um, so these are big areas of focus for a lot of my clients. Um, specifically from a VM perspective, we need certain asset details just to do our scanning or identification, which is just a small part of, of holistic vulnerability management. We need to know our IP ranges, which you would think would be easy, but I worked with a large financial services firm who had no clue what internal IP ranges they were using. We ended up having to go through and, and get a dump from all their routers, their routing tables to figure out what, what blocks of IPs that they were using so we could determine coverage. For application, we need URLs, we need credentials for scanning. We might need to know if there's maintenance windows, is this mutable or immutable infrastructure, right? That could factor into how we do vulnerability management for these assets. And then ownership details for approvals and to determine if we need maintenance windows, if that's not otherwise documented. For some of the other things that we do in vulnerability management, we need um, context about how to uh, analyze, to help us analyze, communicate, and treat our vulnerabilities. And that goes back to the, to the ownership, but also criticality levels and a few other things. Vulnerability management, which is number three, we need to be scanning. Uh, this is what it tells us in the control. We need to be scanning. It should be authenticated so that we get more visibility or, or you could say agent-based nowadays. We need to be managing our security credentials effectively if we are doing the authenticated scanning, and then we should be prioritizing our vulnerabilities. Now, I think we need to be doing a little bit more than that, and I'll talk about that as we move on in the, in, in the, in the presentation. And then in order to move from just identifying vulnerabilities to actually remediating those vulnerabilities, we need to have patch management capabilities, and that's talked about in Control 5, configuration management and control 11. And then circling back to the identification, application security and pen testing. Uh, there are certain things that our automated tools can't find. That's why we do pen testing, especially at the application layer, business logic flaws, authentication, authorization bypass. We're gonna, re we're gonna require certain, um, we're gonna require some manual testing to find those because our signatures are not gonna be written to test business logic that's specific to our organization. If we go on to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about VM in general, what I was talking about with prioritization, and then we'll dive in with how we can maybe get some help. Uh, when I've worked with a variety of organizations, I find that many times we have limited dedicated staff in the VM space. Uh, when I say VM, I'm talking vulnerability management right now, not virtual machines. We love to, to reuse our acronyms in security. Um, but in the VM space, I find that most organizations have maybe one to five people over vulnerability management for the entire organization. 
I'm talking dedicated people. And then we rely a lot on shared resources within the broader IT organization to get things done. And what that ends up looking like, and I've been in this situation before, I worked for a large technology organization where I was the one resource over a thousand developers. So I was the one security resource to help a thousand developers write secure code. And that's not abnormal. I think those, those ratios are fairly consistent in our large enterprises. And so we need to learn how to either justify additional help or to leverage these shared resources appropriately. And when we talk about vulnerability management, we're not just talking about this identify phase, which is what a lot of the, you know, the information in, in control three really focuses on, but how do we analyze the output from our identification? How do we communicate that effectively? And then how do we ultimately get our shared resources to treat those vulnerabilities? Um, and it goes back to what we were saying with you know, we need good, a good asset management so we understand who to assign those vulnerabilities to, but we also just need help with a bunch of other things. And this is where I think SecOps can potentially play a role, right? They are also a potential resource that we can leverage to help us. There's certain things like asset management quality as they go throughout their incident response procedures, if they notice that ownership is out of date or that um, they weren't able to log into the system because the credentials that we're storing in a credential manager are not accurate. They can help update those, those things. And then maybe even if they're not doing incident response, if they just have extra time, they can look at our reports and our metrics to see where credentials are failing and help us get those updated because that's not going to only help us, it's going to help them. Uh, Rescan requests. Since we don't have a dedicated staff that's there 24 seven, what happens when treatment teams come in over the weekend and they fix a vulnerability and they need to have somebody check to make sure that that vulnerability was, was fixed. So rescans is another area where SecOps might be able to provide some help where they can look for those requests and implement those rescans. We can give them permissions. We can make sure that they have visibility into the vulnerabilities on the assets as they go through their incident response process so that when they eradicate the, the issues, they're also getting rid of those vulnerabilities. They could help us with analysis, maybe looking at common false positives that we're encountering in our, um, in our, in our scan results. Like if we identify those false positives, next time we get another one of those, are there some things that they can do with their ability to log into systems and check things out to determine is this a real issue or is it something that we can close out um, or fix some other way so that we don't have to waste the time of some of these other resources. Help us automate that. So if we identify patterns of how we identify these false positives and get rid of them, how do we automate that maybe with our, our SOAR tools or whatever we're using in security operations. And then a couple other areas, threat hunting to identify not only assets not being scanned, but also respond to zero days and other things like what can they do to help us identify new assets, vulnerabilities that aren't being found. And then when we do get a zero day, can they be involved in that zero day response process or can they have a zero day response process that they execute and help us with? And the final thing is uh, vulnerability intake and disclosure processes. If we have a bug bounty program, or even if we don't, we're going to get these reports from external sources. We need to have somebody that's there and willing to, to respond to those requests, determine what our action plan is, and move that through the process. And because these resources are used to going through those workflows and are highly available, maybe more so than our VM resources, they might play a role in that as well. And um, Mark's maybe thinking, okay, well, we're already, <laughs> we're already oversubscribed, so how are we gonna help you with all that stuff? And another thing to think about here is maybe this plays into um, 
not only leveraging maybe some extra capacity within security operations, but as a mechanism to justify expanding that team a bit to help with some of these vulnerability management processes. And that can benefit our incident response and other processes when vulnerability management is not taking up that time or when that becomes more of a problem, right? Obviously, incidents that are happening right now trump our, our vulnerability management processes. And so now we'll have more resources to respond to some of those, those incidents. And now I'll turn the time over to Mark to kind of discuss his take on, on things. Hey, thanks, David. Um, lots of uh, great material there. Um, really rethinking my, uh, my choice to go last um, after the two of you. But uh, I'll, I'll try to follow it up here. Also, shout out to those of you already asking some really great questions in the chat. I know we're going to get to those here at the end, uh, but some really good, good comments and questions there um, that are going to drive some, some good discussion. So for my part of the session, uh, as Randall and some of the others mentioned, I'm going to be coming at this Rex Casino breach uh, from the perspective of SANS Management 551 course, uh, which is building and leading security operations teams. Um, just getting back to the original scenario, of course, RECT had uh, a very small IT team, uh, three individuals that were wearing multiple hats, you know, really no risk management, no governance, no security operations or formal incident response capabilities to, to speak of. And in fact, following this breach in this fictional scenario, uh, they had to engage an outside party to come in and do some of the incident response um, and, and some of the investigation afterward. But carrying through this, uh, this scenario, uh, RECT has decided to invest in a SOC. And so uh, much as David and James did today, I'm gonna talk about um, kind of the SOC perspective, uh, particularly as it relates to these other two um, kind of foundational elements of critical security controls, vulnerability management. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start off kind of at a high level here um, because understanding this scenario where there really wasn't much of a defense in place previously, um, you can look at it kind of one of two ways, maybe both ways. You could say there really were no um, reliable defenses or detection capability. Uh, so anything we do is going to be an improvement, and that's great. On the other hand, flip side is that uh, there is so much to do. Where do we even start? And if you listened to uh, James or David's parts of the series, um, the, their, their webcasts, uh, they talked a little bit about, um, you know, just getting started, making some progress, um, you know, doing the hard work, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but from a security operations perspective, we obviously can't just go slam a bunch of tools in place, hire a bunch more people, and just kind of throw all that at the problem, right? Um, much like a vulnerability management program, much like uh, a solid set of security controls, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. And uh, ultimately what we're building towards in the SOC is we want to field a detection oriented defense, right? We're all about that modern defensive mindset, which is prevention's great. We wanna prevent as much as we can, as much as we know about, but eventually prevention will fail, right? So we have to be confident that when that happens, we are gonna detect uh, that failure uh, that has occurred. Right? We'll be able to respond to it as quickly as possible. Now, one of the first steps in building that detection-oriented defense from the operations side is we have to think about what the threats are. Back when I started doing security operations uh, in about 2002, uh, we had SOC teams, we had SOC tools. And if you were building out one of these capabilities, you were basically going down a checklist. I need a SIM, I need an IDS, I need a firewall. Um, you know, maybe some um, host-based controls in place. 
right? And you're essentially running down a checklist of all the things that you could possibly want to identify or defend against. We don't really have that luxury today, right? We have to be kind of precise. We have to tailor our defenses. Um, and so we have to think about you know, what constitutes a threat. And in our case, in this scenario, what constitutes a threat against the wrecked casino? We know that we had a lot of PII, a lot of financial data uh, leave during the breach. Um, there was likely some impact to operations. It was also a ransomware attack. Um, so, you know, those are some of the kinds of threats, probably two of many, that we need to be concerned about. So I'm going to start at a high level uh, talking about you know, what a threat is. And um, again, from the operation side, we classify a threat as an adversary that has three things, capability, they have the, the resources, the skills, the tools to attack us. They have the opportunity, right, which is some opening that gives them an entree into our network, some vulnerability, some new attack, some piece of infrastructure on our side that they can target, right, some way to attack us. And they also have to have intent. Right? You represent some goal, some objective, whether it's you, know, you are the end goal, or maybe a partner of yours or somebody that you're connected to or have a relationship with, maybe they're the end goal, right? But whatever the case, you represent some goal of the adversary. All of these things need to be present in order for an adversary to be a real threat to you, okay? Now, by understanding what those things are, right? Which, which adversaries out there have, you know, kind of these, check these three boxes, could potentially target us, you know, what are the tactics and techniques they use? What infrastructure do they use? Now we can start to get an idea of as we build out our SOC, the tools, people, processes, you know, where do we want to prioritize our efforts? Where do we want to focus first? We're not going to get everything right out of the gate, right? So building that detection-oriented defense um, requires us to understand these threats, okay? And we don't have to have some robust threat intelligence capability um, but we do need to do a little bit of homework and a little bit of research um, to understand, again, who are the adversaries likely to target, in this case, the gaming industry, organizations that have the kind of data that Wrecked Casino has, right? Um, maybe target organizations the size or the risk profile that Wrecked Casino has, okay? Understand those adversaries, again, what TTPs they're likely to use, and then out of those TTPs, which are we most vulnerable to? Which are we most likely to see in our environment? Right? Vulnerability management can inform this process by giving us a sense of that opportunity. What are the opportunities that our weaknesses give our adversaries to target us? Right? We can also kind of infer attacker intent. If we see vulnerabilities being exploited, or we see an attacker attempting to an exploit a vulnerability, right? We can infer some intent there. On the CIS controls side, right? The controls reflect that opportunity. If we have weaknesses that we wanna shore up, right? Vulnerabilities that maybe we wanna compensate for, perhaps vulnerabilities that we can't just patch or update, right? We're gonna put controls in place to compensate for that. Those controls have to reflect that opportunity, right, that we want to deny the attacker right, and reflect their capabilities. The SOC, if you look at our Venn diagram here, kind of lives at the intersection of all of these things. And the SOC is going to be gathering and applying intelligence, to help us understand where to prioritize our controls, right? um, going to help us understand on the vulnerability man management side, um, do we have any shadow IT out there? Do we have any infrastructure that's not covered by our vulnerability management program that hasn't been scanned, that hasn't been updated? David uh, just finished up kind of talking about some of this, right? And what's the status of our security controls? What kind of coverage do we have? Are they effective? Right? Are the controls failing in some way that we can identify through the incident response process, right? Again, the SOC is going to kind of live at the intersection of these things uh, taking inputs from and providing outputs back into these other functions. You can't really have one without the others um, and, and do security operations effectively. So it's really important. 
Uh, next slide, please. Now I wanted to show first off on the vulnerability management side, how the, these inputs and outputs work. And you can see on the right in our security operations center, if we were to abstract some of the different functions that are happening in the wrecked casino SOC. And again, we're doing some level of intelligence collection and analysis, even if that's going out and you know, reading security blogs, looking at news stories, getting RSS feeds, looking at Twitter, right? Even if it's something as kind of basic as those tasks, we're trying to get a sense of who the adversaries are, how they're likely to target us, right? We're also getting inputs on the internal side. So from within Wrecked Casino, right? intelligence doesn't just come from the outside, it comes from inside our own environment as we seek to better understand, again, what are our weaknesses? What does our environment look like? James talked about, you know, the first couple of uh, CIS controls include things like software inventory, hardware inventory, right? So what is the makeup, the composition of our environment? Right? How is it organized? Is our network segmented? Really key questions like that, that give us in the SOC some of the context and some of the answers we need to properly investigate things that we're gonna see in our tools. When we do see those things, alerts, potential threats, maybe new vulnerabilities we weren't previously aware of, we're gonna triage, prioritize those things, again, based on our understanding of our adversaries, our understanding of our internal environment. We're gonna to respond to those incidents and the output of the SOC, really at the end of the day, should be remediated issues, remediated incidents. Even if there's no real security incident, right, an investigation should have a set of actionable outputs. We need to tune our security tools to detect things more effectively, right? Or, hey, we had uh, some infrastructure that wasn't coming under the, the purview of our critical controls, right, that we've deployed, or maybe wasn't being scanned or was, hasn't been included in our vulnerability management program because we didn't know about it, right? Those kinds of outputs are going to go back into the vulnerability management process, some additional situational awareness, and then we are going to consume inputs in the form of, again, contextual information, detection priorities. Hey, we have this uh, these public-facing systems. Here's their risk profile based on the vulnerability scanning that we've done. Okay, if there are weaknesses there that we know about, that knowledge is like gold in the sock. We often talk about in security how we hate, we hate a bolt-on, right? You can't just bolt on security after the fact. Well, guess what? Now, about 20 years in, RECT is bolting on a security operations capability. That's the reality. And while it's great that they've decided to do that, the SOC is going to be operating from a place of very, very limited insight, very limited knowledge, hiring a lot of new people that probably are not that familiar with the environment. And that's a challenge that most of us are facing when we're building new SOC teams, right? building out new capabilities, very limited information. You're essentially bolting on a capability to your organization. So getting plugged in with other capabilities like your vulnerability scanning and vulnerability management in that process, right? Again, that insight is like gold to the SOC for adding context, adding useful background information for what it is they're looking at and what they should do with that information. So if we can advance to the next slide, um, I also wanna talk about the criti critical security controls and the SOC. Now, in uh, his part of the webcast, I know James talked about uh, kind of doing the hard thing and the hard work. And a lot of times on my side of the house in operations, uh, you know, we start talking about security controls and tailoring and implementing controls. And, uh, you know, it's very easy for an instant responder or SOC analyst to kind of think, eh, you know, that, that sounds, that's not really my thing. You know, I'm just going to uh, watch my console. You know, you let me know when a breach happens or I need to go investigate. I'll focus on that. Right? But we can't afford to ignore the foundational work that we have to do in deploying uh, those security controls. In fact, 
if you have any role in incident response, right, that's a big part of preparation. And I think about it this way, we're preparing the environment to be defended, right? So we're deploying uh, our controls, we're doing those asset inventories, we're doing vulnerability management, gathering that intelligence about our environment, right? That supports our detection and analysis processes, supports how we respond, how we contain threats, right? And then as part of that post-incident activity, we're gonna be taking feedback. How did the controls work? Were they effective? Did they buy us time and opportunity to identify these attacks at multiple stages? This kind of gets back to a question that Matthew asked earlier um, in the chat about zero days, right? Zero days previously unseen or unknown attacks. And of course, you can't always be 100% confident that you're gonna identify zero days. I don't care what product vendors tell you, right? But what you can do is you can narrow down the path of an attacker, right? As narrowly as you possibly can by adding different security controls. We want to control and dictate to the attacker how they're gonna get into our environment, right? Control those avenues of attack. And then within those avenues, we want to try to give ourselves as many different opportunities as we possibly can to detect what's happening. So they might use a zero day for that initial exploitation, for that phase of the attack. And maybe there's no way that we're going to be able to detect that. But you know what? Once they do that, they're probably going to fall back on tried and true tactics and techniques to uh, do some internal discovery, right? See what else is going on in our environment, what else they can get to move laterally, right? establish persistence. And at some point in that chain, right? ideally, we're going to catch that attack. So deploying those controls, um, getting that situational awareness, that's a big part of establishing a detection chain so that even when you miss the first thing, right, you can catch the second, third, or fourth things. That's really the goal there. Uh, next slide, please. Now, just to summarize, we've all kind of gone through and, and hopefully filled you in on uh, our perspective, how uh, vulnerability management, critical security control, security operations kind of work together in this, uh, what we call security leadership triad, right, from the perspective of our, our courses. Um, but I think it's important to note that in this fictional scenario, right, we tried to do this through the context of a real world type of scenario. Doing this incident response, identifying this breach, responding, whether you do it really well or you do it kind of poorly because you weren't prepared, that is only the beginning of the journey. Right? Even as we go down the path of deploying these key security controls and doing vulnerability management, building out the SOC, uh, we're still going to have breaches. We're still going to experience incidents. We have to learn from those scenarios, right? And, and rebuild and improve over time. There are lots of great reference frameworks out there. Um, we've referenced many of them uh, in this webcast series, the CIS controls, all those. Um, you know, use what's there as foundation and a roadmap, um, but also understand that you're gonna have to tailor what's there to your environment. And the best insights, the best intelligence, uh, the best understanding of your, your risk profile is going to come from within your own environment. So don't look to, you know, third parties, external resources uh, entirely, you know, to tell you that. Um, threat intelligence from a SOC perspective is a, a very important input to the process to kind of prioritize what you're, you're going to do um, from a detection standpoint, align your capabilities to your threat model. We've mentioned threat models several times today. Uh, it's really important to have a threat model that is specific to your organization and act based on that. And then finally, uh, it's all about visibility and assessment and improvement. So you're not going to tackle any one of these three things that we've talked about today uh, overnight or in a week, or probably in a month, uh, maybe not even in a year, right? But the goal is to get some capability, benchmark what you've got, build from there. Um, try to expand that visibility and, uh, and improve performance over time. And with that, uh, I think that brings us to the end of the slides and uh, hopefully leaves us some time for Q&A.
Uh, yes, absolutely it does. So we do have some questions built up. Uh, I'll just go ahead and ask, um, I, the content of uh, each of these courses complements one another. Where would one start? Um, I guess maybe since James has been quiet for a little bit, I'll let you go ahead and address that if you'd like to. And then uh, um, David and Mark, if you'd like to add any context. Sure. I mean, I guess I would take a, a little bit of a it depends answer, but I mean, part of it is what scratches your itch, right? So if you're directly struggling with, you know, sock related issues or in the process of implementing one, well, certainly that's going to be a great place for you to start, right? Because it's, again, it's addressing what you need. Um, the thing that you know, Alan Pollard has drilled into our heads for years is that the things that you learn in the classroom at SANS, we want you to be able to put into practice into your office the day you get home. So um, really, I would say I would start by answering the question is what is it that you need right now, um, more than just this being an academic exercise. Um, sort of a pat answer would be that, I mean, certainly um, the CIS controls sort of provide the overview. So if you're looking for the big picture, you might want to start there and then go into the specific area. But I'm always a big fan of sort of a, approaching what it is that you specifically are looking to address now and that you're working on presently. So it's more than just an academic conversation. Great. Uh, thank you. And um, I think I'm going to go ahead and ask this because it's a, it's a high level question and there are some more uh, technical detail questions to get to, but somebody was asking about uh, an overarching certification or credential for um, the operational cybersecurity executive triad. And um, uh, we are going to, it's building upon this. Uh, Management 551 is moving to a five-day course that is new that will be uh, released and uh, publicly announced as well. Uh, I think open for next week, uh, registration next week. And uh, we do have uh, GX certifications in the works for um, 516 and 551 both. Uh, once uh, those GX certifications are in place, uh, there will be a, a, a coin, um, uh, a coin accreditation that will cover all three in the triad. So that's very exciting stuff that is coming up. Um, uh, that was a more general question. Uh, I'd like to get to some of the ones that are a little bit more detailed. Um, this one, uh, James, you again might be good to answer this or, or um, other guys, please jump in if you want us. Uh, uh, Mark was asking about, um, uh, sorry, in the chat, uh, the solar winds attacks didn't seem to be financially driven, but possibly nation state espionage or information stealing. Do you see this as an increasing trend across the board or perhaps only in certain industries? Um, sure, I'll take a quick stab and then anybody else wants to jump in can as well. Um, I mean, these attacks have been going on for 20, 25 years. I mean, so the nation state attacks aren't new by any means. I would say that we're probably getting more visibility into them. Um, and I think there's been more transparency, especially from the U.S. government, um, just to make people aware of the kinds of issues that are going on. Um, if you haven't read some of the books out there, like uh, Fred Kaplan's book, Dark Territory, uh, I'm always a big fan of, you know, looking through some of the historical stuff going on. That's a great place to start to get some longer term answers on that. Um, but long story short, I mean, you're, you have motivated attackers, some of which are financed by, let's say, um, governments. And frankly, some of which are not financed by governments, but still have just as big of an impact. Uh, one of the things that we went through as we developed the open threat taxonomy was we were trying to figure out sort of these different classifications of threats. And one of the things that I realized pretty quick in the process was us as defenders focused on actors often doesn't give us the benefit we need. So we, we tend not to prioritize that. Now, my friends in law enforcement will disagree because they have the ability to actually go after the actors themselves. As a defender, I don't have that ability. So what I tend to recommend to most clients is focus on the actions that the attackers can take. And again, whether it's a nation state or whether it's a cybercrime group, honestly, it doesn't matter. The methodologies is what I'd probably be focused on the most there. And uh, actually, uh, David, I'll ask, I have a question queued up for you, but I'll ask if you have anything to add to that uh, um, about um, nation state uh, threat actors. Um, I, I mean, not really. I mean, with the nation states, it's really going to be like, how do we respond to these? Obviously, the most recent one with solar winds that goes back to the zero day. How do we detect and respond in our environment? And um, just to add to what others have said there, you know, from a response perspective, we're not going to have a signature to go out and detect those right away. It might take a while. Even when we do get the signature, it's going to take a while for us to get a scan back to determine which devices are affected. We might be able to respond more quickly if we have a solid software asset inventory that we can query to figure out where we have that installed in our environment. So that's one way of responding more quickly in a zero day event. 
Uh, another way is, let's say we don't have a software asset inventory and this feeds into the first question in the chat. What can we look at? Well, chances are that in the past, somewhere in our environment where SolarWinds is installed or in the more recent one exchange, we have had a vulnerability, right? If there has been a vulnerability on that software on that version. And so we can find that data, right? We can find out which assets have that software installed by mining the data from our VM tools as well. There's also some free capabilities like OS Query um, and OSQL, which is a port to Windows. If we have a fleet manager, we can actually just query our systems dynamically. We could look into patch and configuration management systems as well to mine their data stores to see what's installed in what versions. And so there, we have a lot of this information already, even if we don't have a software asset management database, we just need to find it. And then because I've talked about already, you know, three or four different repos where we can get this information, how can we leverage those to do some correlation and figure out where we have gaps, where our VM tool set is not seeing those, those software packages, but our patch and configuration management technologies are, and vice versa. Hey, you, you know, how can we improve the quality of both of our, our scanning and our remediation by doing some comparisons between those data sets. Uh, now, as part of that, that first question is all we, as well, they, they mentioned, hey, we can, if we don't have an, a hardware asset management inventory, let's get that from our VMware tool because we're doing discovery, right? That's a form of discovery. The same can be said there. Let's mine patch management, configuration management, endpoint detection and response, active directory, all of these data sets that have information about what exists in our environment. And let's start using those to do some comparisons and to figure out where we're missing stuff, where we don't have endpoint detection installed, where we, where we um, aren't doing VM scanning that we should be doing VM scanning, where devices no longer exist, but we're still reporting vulnerabilities on those devices because we no longer see them in patch, configuration management, endpoint detection, when we investigate why they're not in all of those three, we find out that asset doesn't exist anymore. Well, let's get that out of our VM tool set because we're asking people to remediate vulnerabilities that just, just aren't there anymore. And so there's a lot that we can do with all of these data sets if we're just doing some analysis to imp improve our, our ability to, to respond to these types of events and to also improve the quality for, for future, uh, quality of our data for, for future events. Thank you for transitioning nicely into that, uh, to that next question and covering that. Um, Mark, I think this is uh, kind of another transition, but Mark, I think this came up in your presentation. Uh, is inventory and vulnerability management a two horse race between Qualys and Tenable, or can you use lower cost tools such as Manage Engine or PDQ or even free tools such as Spiceworks? So, yeah. Uh, Mark, yeah, was, to, David, I was going to punt to you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. actually on the tool question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm happy to take that one. So Qualys, Tenable, Rapid7, uh, Tripwire has their IP360 product. There's a few out there that are considered, you know, the enterprise identification tools. But can you use something else? And I always tell my students, or I, I sometimes tell my students at the beginning of the class, or I ask them, of the the five phases in our PACT model, model, prepare, identify, analyze, communicate, treat, which is the most important. And I think because in security, we're always so directly involved in identify, we tend to gravitate towards that. In my mind, that's the least important phase because we already know what patches are outstanding. We already know which configurations are out of compliance. We already know a lot of things. Now we're still gonna to need to do identification to satisfy compliance requirements. And chances are they're gonna want us to be using one of those products, right? Our, our auditors, they're gonna be looking for a Qualys or a Tenable or a Rapid7 or a Tripwire or something like that. But if we don't have, if we're not subject to those audits or if we can convince the auditors that it's okay to use something else, 
there are other options out there that we can look at. I already mentioned leveraging what we already know from our patch and configuration management tool set. If we're a Linux shop, then OpenSCAP is like a free capability from Red Hat or an open source capability that we can use um, to identify vulnerabilities. Another interesting thing is if we've moved heavily to uh, an immutable architecture where we're not keeping things around for a long time, especially if we've moved towards more of a container environment, we can do some image analysis, right? And maybe we don't even need to do broad identification throughout the environment if we can, if we can show that we're identifying the vulnerabilities in the images where we understand the risk because we are now taking those vulnerabilities associated with the image, images and calculating how many of those images are used on average within the organization to highlight the risk and that we're remediating the vulnerabilities in those images based on that, that risk data that we're, we're creating. None of that's necessarily easy or as automated as the way we've traditionally done vulnerability management, but the, the, the clients that I have that are actually succeeding with vulnerability management are typically the ones that are following that model. And that's partly because they don't get trapped and stuck with these legacy environments, legacy applications that make vulnerability management so much harder. Like I'm stuck with, you know, half of my infrastructure needs an old version of Java because I either have third-party software or custom developed applications that require that old version of Java to run. Or we need this old, you know, Chrome browser because our applications aren't up to date and, uh, and it requires this older version of Chrome in our environment. You see that stuff all the time. And that's why when we hear prioritization, prioritization, prioritization all the time in, in vulnerability management, prioritization doesn't always work. If we haven't already gone through and identified some of those roadblocks or root cause issues and excluded those from the vulnerabilities that we're prioritizing and sending over to our remediation teams. Because we can prioritize all we want. If the top things are always the things that we can't fix, they'll look at the report and say, oh, we've already discussed this, I can't fix those. And they'll go back and do the other things that they, they have to do. Everybody's oversubscribed, right? We know that. And, uh, and so we've got to find a way of getting those maybe set aside where we're still going to find a fix, but it's a different type of fix than having somebody patch or configure a system. Uh, well, I think uh, we'll try to squeeze in one more question here. And I think this is kind of in line with how this has gone. So uh, I'll just skip to that last one, which is how many inventory tools is enough and what are inventory best practices? What do you think about static spreadsheets versus dynamic tenable inventory tools? Can I just say uh, surrender to the spreadsheet? That's all I want to throw out there. If you're all in your, in your career, you're always going to come back to the spreadsheet at some point. So spreadsheets aren't awful. Surrender to the spreadsheet. And uh, now, now I'll let one of the other two. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of interesting approaches we can take to inventory right now, especially with the cloud where everything's so dynamic that having a spreadsheet or a tool becomes less valuable because it's changing all the time. We're more likely to follow an immutable approach to our architecture. Well, let the cloud be your inventory. Let the virtualization platform be your inventory. Anytime we need to find out what exists, we query the API and we ask. And then how do we store context? Because that's another thing that's important. Yeah, we can tell that this asset exists, but who owns it? who's responsible for remediating the vulnerabilities. Maybe it's different for patches and configuration changes. Store that information in tags. Most of the technologies that we use, even in the vulnerability management space, if that's what we're using for inventory tool, we'll store tags. So let's start putting some of that context inside in line. And there's even tools that you can use to, to automate the enforcement of that, especially in the cloud, these cloud security tools. And I have lots of clients that are doing that. You cannot create a resource if it doesn't have these seven tags. And if it does, we shut it down and we alert you and say, hey, you got to recreate this with these tags and then we will let it exist in our cloud environment. If not, yeah, it's, it's not there. We're, we're not going to allow it. And that forces you to have a more accurate and up-to-date environment. 
But if we don't have a tool, if we don't have something right now, use a spreadsheet, use a data warehouse, engage with your business intelligence team to find a place to store this information and to do some of that reconciliation that I talked about as well, to pull in all these other data sets and figure out where you have you know, duplicates or missing information or decommissioned assets that aren't up 